Our first speaker is Carlos Suarez and he is the coordinator of the Catalan National Assembly London branch. So without further ado, I'll pass over. Hi everyone. Um, thank the SWP for organizing this event. It's a pleasure for me to be here, uh, in particular in this university, as this is where I studied economics a few years ago. So it's always good to be back um, in these kinds of events. The Catalan independence movement is a story, like so many others that we've seen in the last 10 years, of a national pro-sovereignty movement led by working middle, middle classes against austerity. In Greece, we saw Syriza, in Spain, Podemos, in Italy, Five Stars, and in Catalonia, similar to Scotland, the increase of, of the independence movement. There's always been a, a, a important independence support in Catalonia, as Catalonia is an oppressed nation within Spain, the Catalan language and culture has been forbidden for centuries and during the 40 years of the Franco regime, and its economy has been constrained also in the last 40 years of Spanish democracy. However, it was a minority until the financial crash, the Great Recession, and five years of hard austerity and spending cuts. In the whole of Spain, it created the rise of um, the Indignados movement, which led to Podemos, and in Catalonia, what it created is the increase of the independence movement as a whole and of the anti-capitalist party coup in particular. Social pressure led by the Catalan National Assembly, which I'm part of, was so strong that the Catalan regional parties not only incorporated a pro-sovereignty narrative, but actually organized an independence referendum, which is what we saw two years ago in October 17. Spain declared it illegal, send the riot police to attack voters, which by the way, we have to thank Jeremy Corbyn, as he was one of the first international voices to condemn Spanish violence that day. And Spain also sent to jail half of the Catalan regional government, while the other half went into exile. President Puigdemont in Belgium and Clara Punxati in Scotland, where she had the extradition hearing this week, actually. After a shameful trial, in which all the defense rights were violated and which literally seemed the 17th century Spanish Inquisition. A month ago, on October 14, Spain condemned to prison all the Catalan political leaders for up to 13 years um, prison sentence for the former vice president of the government, 11 years for the former speaker of the Catalan parliament, and nine years for the civil society leaders, such as the president of my organization, the Catalan National Assembly. Which takes us to the current situation. What we have seen in the last four weeks after the sentence was made public was a, is a genuine Catalan revolt, daily protests, an assault to the Barcelona airport, barricades in Barcelona for the first time since the Spanish Civil War. And this last week, the main highway connecting Spain to France has been blocked um, by Catalan protesters during three days. And just allow me to make a point here. There's been sometimes a narrative uh, or better call it uh, Spanish regime propaganda, that it, it is the Catalan bourgeois that's leading the independence movement. That's just nonsense. The Catalan banks and establishment were the first ones to fight independence and move their headquarters outside of Catalonia in October 17. And in this week, the employee associations have screamed at the road blocking strategy as the Catalan private sector profitability is mostly based on logistics and its import and export capabilities. While the protests are increasing, so is the Spanish levels of repression. The Spanish regime has deployed several thousand officers in Catalonia in order to keep repressing the movement. Right now, 80% of Spanish riot police is, has been sent to Catalonia. In the last 30 days alone, there's been more than 900 injured by police, including 60 journalists. 14 activists are still in hospital, two of them fighting for their lives, four have lost an eye, and two have lost a testicle. More than 300 people, including young teenagers, have been arrested. 30 of them have been sent to jail without trial. And there are also seven activists in a Spanish prison since September, since September 23rd accused of terrorism, some of them in solitary confinement. That's where we are right now. The Catalan protests follow three main aims. Peace, a return home of the Spanish police, freedom, the immediate release of all Catalan political prisoners, and independence, 
a binding self-determination referendum monitored by the international community. There are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. That's the situation Catalonia was in October 17, and that's the situation we are right now. Let's make the most of it, also here in the UK, helping with articles, letters, mobilizations, and others to help gain support with public opinion and political support. The Spanish elections last week showed the rise of fascist party box. While it is more of the same of Steve Bannon and Salvini narrative, in Spain, fascism is above all focused on its anti-Catalanism and its desire to illegalize independence parties and suspend regional autonomy. This is because the Spanish capitalist project is based on a central power which extracts resources from its periphery. And hence, other national identities that resist this strategy is considered as they, their enemy and must be terminated. And this is also why the left of, of Spain, the so-called Socialist Party, can't accept a democratic solution and is against recognizing self-determination uh, for Catalonia. The future is dark as we have seen in Bolivia, in Chile, and elsewhere. But there is also a window of opportunity to clarify and establish alliances across the world. In this international fight against fossil capitalism, against rise of authoritarian regimes, the Catalan independence movement is your ally. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much for that. That was great. Um, okay, our next speaker is Kia um, from the UK Student Climate Network. Morning. <laughs> Afternoon. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm from the UK Student Climate Network. We help coordinate the climate strikes in the UK. Uh, it's cool. Um, <laughs> Yeah, socialism in the 21st century. Uh, I'm only 16, so it's basically my entire life and I've seen a constant development in political opinions um, from when I was tiny with uh, big anti-war movements through to now where the cam uh, climate change movement has influ influenced so many young people to actually give a shit. And it's really inspiring for me as uh, an activist or as someone who's grown up politically to see a change in people's uh, view of our current system. Now, as I'm sure everybody here would agree, capitalism is obsolete. There is, there is nothing about our current system that is beneficial to the way our, uh, or to our planet or to normal people, working class people, minorities, the global south. It's inherently rigged to be detrimental to the working classes. And that's why we've got to, we, we have to oppose it. And I'm, very sure that everybody would definitely agree with that. And if you don't, please leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think it's indisputable that in the past year we've seen an, a massive increase in social unrest globally. And this, this is because of things like the climate movement, uh, because of the, co the growth in the far right that we've had to combat like Stand Up to Racism, the other anti-fascist organisations, we have beat down 15,000 on the street of London to 100 squabbling in a pub. This is, this is what, this, uh, what socialist movements do, and this is how they grow. We come together in times of struggle, and we have managed to do that in the past year so well, but there's obviously, as my comrade mentioned, <laughs> dark times are ahead and there's a lot to do. But I think it's really important to recognise the progression that we've made uh, as a movement and to the minds that we've changed. I speaking a lot about the climate movement because obviously I'm a climate activist, but uh, I have friends who I go to school with who before had never considered any kind of politics, had always uh, viewed the police as an aid to their livelihoods, who had come from a more entitled background, who have now shown themselves as revolutionaries and have decided that suddenly their politics is, uh, is they want to implement their politics to help the working classes and to actually create social change in the interests of normal people and not to just be complicit in a system that is so inherently flawed. And I think it's brilliant. I think we, what, uh, what we've seen happen and what we've seen develop in uh, the past year and in the past 
16 years for me is incredible. Um, We want we st obviously we still want to see radical reforms, and I know uh, Comrade earlier was talking about how potentially Jeremy Corbyn could take on the establishment. I don't think he can. Uh, I think Jeremy Corbyn is an incredible person and will have excellent reforms. However, it's up to us to challenge the establishment, and it's up to us to make sure that social change is actually implemented on a grassroots level. Uh, and I think that's entirely entirely achievable. Looking around. See, uh, so many campaigns have come together uh, in order. To, oh, what's fuck? <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I'm very prepared. Um, don't laugh at me. Uh, yeah, I think we have a very positive future. Uh, potentially a very positive future if we can actually get things done. We we have a movement so that on the 29th uh, everyone's going to come out hopefully on strike. The UCU have are on strike, the school students are on strike about climate change. This is something that has unified so many voices and so many cultures and so many people globally uh, from the Organi 9 to people in Turkey uh, being told that they can't strike because of um, their support of Kurdistan to people in, well, here, where we very helpfully have the uh, democratic right to protest. It's unified so many voices, and I think that we just need to bolster one, uh, one another. We, we are a collective mind when it comes down to it. We are a collective uh, ideology. We have a collective ideology full of individuals. We are we are socialists. We we know. We have a morally moral obligation to help one another and to show that solidarity through and through. So I think uh, the next year, the next couple years, and hopefully for the rest of the twenty first century, we want to see good social change uh, that is implemented well from a grassroots movement. And yay. <laughs> Forest. Thanks, Kia, for that really inspiring talk. Um, our next speaker is Mario Nain, and he is a socialist from Chile who is involved in the resistance of the Pinochet regime and is also a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. Um, cameras, let me begin to say that uh, I am very glad uh, to be here in front of uh, this uh, young uh, people, which is uh, the future of uh, humanity, I could say. I'm here, of course, uh, to talk about the amazing uprising that is taking place in Chile. It is uh, already four weeks of intensive uh, battle between the forces of the state and an entirely population. When I'm talking about an entirely population, it is in reality. Up and down the country in Chile, people came out in mass numbers to say that no more with the free uh, market economy, no more with the neoliberalism. But I, I think in order to understand exactly the enormity, the militancy, and the courageous uh, youth of Chile, it is important to give a very brief history about the free market economy imposed in Chile. It was imposed in 1973 after a ruthless military dictatorship that took place in 1973 where there was execution, disappearance, illegalization of the union movement. Anyone who re resisted the regime, either he was killed in the spot, or anyone tried to resist the regime was tortured, was disappeared, and exiled. And I think the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, the tyrant of Chile, almost killed 
the revolutionary movement that took place from 1970 to 1973. And then the democracy, the so-called Bujosi democracy, came about in Chile in 1980s, but the same recipe of neoliberalism was imposed either by the reactionary uh, government or by the left government in Chile. So what was really this uh, free market economy? From my point of view, this is an extreme version of neoliberalism. I do not know whether in other countries has been applied with that rigid iron sort of, you know, method of exploitation. I have no idea, but let me give you a few examples. In Chile, workers, they work between 14 and 16 hours per day just to meet you know, the, the, the basic survival where food, transport, and other things are that it is extremely necessary. They have pri privatized every single institution you can think of. Health, education, electricity, water, uh, forest, and rivers. This is an extremely sort of, you know, thing that I have discovered in this four weeks period. Imagine if this racist Johnson privatized the Thames. It, this, is, this is the equivalent what's going on in Chile. At the same time, for 40 years, the very rich in, in Chile has amazed an, an, an unbelievable fortune. The one percent, they take about 37% of the wealth of Chile for themselves. This is an extremely unequal society. I can give you more examples how crude neoliberalism has been applied in Chile. For example, to be a pensioner is almost a death sentence. And this is not a language that I use in order to have an emotive sort of, you know, speech. It is the reality. If you're a pensioner, you have to keep working until you drop dead. Let me give you an example. I saw an interview of this young man working with this 75 years old man in a supermarket. The young man said, my mate, it shouldn't be working. It should be enjoy life. It should be enjoy retirement. But he has to go keep working because the pension, the private pension that exists in Chile is not enough even to live the day to day. More graphically, what I'm talking about is a sentence of death for the old people. Four weeks before the uprising, on national news, on Chile, in Chile, there was this case where a couple of pensioners, they committed suicide and leaving a note, we cannot keep going because we don't have any food. This is the reality and the cruelty of the system. But people have fought back for nearly four weeks, an entire population came to the street. One and a half million people, this the first week of the uprising, gathering in, in a square, which they have changed the name. In a state, the official name is Plaza Italia. Now the name is Dignity Square because people, not only they were starving, hunger was hunting down the population, but also the dignity as a human being. You work all your life and it's robbed by a parasite, which is only the 1%. So the 99% began saying no, no more about this neoliberalism. 
The only things that uh, an uprising and a living uprising shows you is not only the intensity where youth have burned down all the oppressive buildings like police stations, like supermarkets, like posh hotels. And they said, and I always remember, I think it was the first or the second day when a youth jumped in front of the te television camera and he said, if there isn't any change, we're going to fucking burn down the whole city. And I thought, <laughs> and I thought in my naivety, because I have lived in this country for so many years, I haven't been following what was going on in my native country. I thought he was a bit over the top. <laughs> and then I realized how serious he was. How serious that people, they don't have no other option, really. No other option to put themselves on the line, especially the youth, fighting the police, fighting an army that Pineda brought the third day of the uprising. But the people were inti not intimidated in the least. They were uprising in every single city, in every single town, in every single little village. I saw road blockade in the rural area where they said, yes, my brother and sister in the city, they are fighting for every single one of us. So this enormous uprising has put the ruling class on the corner. What are they are doing, what they are doing is in four weeks, yes, we really need a new constitution because the constitution is so rigid. And therefore, three days ago, they were in the Moneda Palace, this political elite left and right discussing, you know, the new constitution. But those people who weren't invited were the workers that they produced the wealth of every single day to be robbed by this parasite elite. The Mapuches Indian, which I belong to, they weren't invited. And the indigenous Mapuche, they have been suffering 500 years of exploitation and humiliation. They weren't on the table of discussion. The wonderful student who began 10 years ago fighting against privatization, they weren't there. The shantytown dwellers fighting, you know, for the basic necessity of water, electricity, a roof, they were there. Only the political elite, they are designing and writing the new constitution. And the mass movement, unrightly so, say, fuck you, we're not going to accept this new constitution. But let me also, comrades, tell you, when there is an uprising, when the mass of people enter the stage of history, something remarkable happened. Not only we can win, but also let me give you an example of a striking image that is going around the world. My people of the South, went to the city center, brought down the conqueror status, uh, status, dragged his iron body, cut off his head, and placed it in the, in, in the, in the, in the hands of our uh, one military leader, leader, a Mapuche leader called Cao Polican. But it's not only that, all over the country, the, 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 the sign of oppression, is coming down. When I saw those people writing their own history from below, I said, this is a revenge of history because our military leader was executed by the Spaniards. And here we are, the people themselves, there was another ex symbolic execution. So this is what's going on 
far away from this world, a country called Chile. But to finish, comrade, I know I've got very little time. I've got so many images, I've got so many things to say that I have to condense. But one thing is important uh, to emphasize and re-emphasize. This political movement, this social movement, doesn't have a revolutionary party. A revolutionary party is something central to any struggle that is taking place in the world. Why we need a revolutionary party? A revolutionary party forged, you know, well before an uprising, shoulder to shoulder with workers, shoulder to shoulder with students. And when it comes to this particular conjuncture, the revolutionary party has the authority to say, not only we want to change neoliberalism, but we are fighting against an oppressive system. To finish off, I'm going to echo the words of a great revolutionary, Rosa Luxemburg, who was killed fighting for freedom. She said in her time, humanity is facing two drastic choice, either barbarism or socialism. Now we are more near to barbarism when she was alive. Look at the climate catastrophe. The system, the capitalist system, and the rulers, they are driving humanities. They are driving nature into an abbey of a catastrophic consequences. Look at what happened in Yorkshire. It's underwater. Look at what happened in Delhi. In Delhi and uh, in Australia, people, they are choking with the smoke. They are really, really worried about what's going on in the world. That is the reason I'm very glad to be with my comrade from Catalonia and the climate uh, student. The climate student put seven million people around the world the 20th of September. The Hong Kong students, wonderful fighters, wonderful militants in Bolivia that are fighting against the reactionary coup. And this is the second thing. Socialism, it is a possibility. That possibility is, has been shown by all the uprising that is going on around the world. So I could say, that a new society, a new beginning, a new spring, it is possible. But it is possible when we organize in a genuine revolutionary party. So I could say, long live the uprising of the world. Um, just draw your attention to the books at the front. <laughs> There's bookmark stall um, in the foyer, so have a look at it um, on your way out because it's got some really good literature um, to summarise everything we've been talking about this weekend. Okay, so our final speaker um, of the plenary and of the weekend is Amy Leather, who is the Joint National Secretary for the Socialist Workers' Party and a contributor to the book um, System Change, Not Climate Change. I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that really, but I mean it has been, so thank you to all the speakers. I mean it's been a brilliant weekend, hasn't it? I mean I hope everyone's enjoyed it as much as I have done. So thanks to everyone who organised it, and thanks to everyone for coming and making it so good really. Um, but the truth is now, the truth is now, we've got to go from here, we've got a lot to do. And we're going to have to go from here with a renewed sense of urgency. Um, we've got less than four weeks till the general election. It's a very stark choice, isn't it? Boris Johnson a racist, sexist homophobe, versus Jeremy Corbyn, someone who spent his entire life opposing war and racism austerity. It is going to matter who is in number 10. But yeah, the next few weeks are not just about waiting for that election. 
they're going to be punctuated by days of action, struggle and strikes. I mean, for some reason, the powers that be have decided bringing Donald Trump to London for a NATO conference is a good idea. We've got to make sure he gets the welcome he deserves, and that is the biggest possible protest on the 3rd of December here in London. Stand Up to Racism has called the demonstration. There's one's going on around the country. Get the leaflets. Let's make sure that's a big demo. It's part of taking on the racism during the election campaign and keeping it out of the campaign. I mean, remember, this is Donald Trump who wanted to broker the deal between Boris Johnson and Farage in the election his two racist friends. And in less than two weeks, we've got the climate strike, the 29th of November. I mean, what a day the 20th of September was. 350,000 people went out and protested in, in towns and cities across Britain. And it was part of a global movement, seven million people involved in countries all over. We've got to do everything possible to make the 29th of November as big as we can <laughs> and link up with the university workers in the UCU who are going to be on strike that week and on that day as well. Because the thing is, how big and successful these days of action and protest are are going to be crucial for what comes after the election. Because whoever wins the election, whoever is in government, we will need more struggle on the streets, on the university campuses and in the workplaces. Now, obviously, that's the case if Boris Johnson is there. We're going to need more struggle. I mean, Britain's already a country of food banks, low pay, child poverty. And we'll have to try and fight to stop Boris Johnson ripping up everything from the NHS to education and taking on his racism. But even if Jeremy Corbyn was in number 10, he is going to face a barrage of attacks from the ruling class. Big business, financial institutions, the banking industry. They're going to do everything possible to try and sabotage anything that might remotely challenge their profits. Do you remember when Corbyn tweeted a picture of Virgin Trains being overcrowded and the tirade of attacks that came from Virgin Trains? Well, now they're talking about uh, renationalising the rail, the water, the big energy companies, the post service, even broadband. Boss is not just going to let that happen. We're going to need to fight to stop their sabotage. And it's not just the bosses and Tories who will try and stop Corbyn. There's plenty of right-wingers, even within the Labour Party, who want to stop his radical policies. We have to stop then putting the pressure on him and uh, for the wider change, for him to retreat and compromise. So everything we do now is going to help shape the terrain for what, what comes after the election. And there's an urgency, because the future of our planet is at stake. I mean, global emissions actually went up 2% last year. You know, the Amazon is burning. California and Australia are on fire. Apparently this is a new normal to expect. You know, cities from Venice to Doncaster are drowning. Countries across the global south suffering in the ways that people have talked about. And the truth is, capitalism cannot solve the problem of climate catastrophe. Because it's not like they haven't known about it. I mean, there was a recent survey that came out and it said that 20 fossil fuel companies are responsible for a third of greenhouse gas emissions since 1965. It tells you very clearly who's to blame, but they chose the date 1965 to do the survey because that was when the industry and politicians knew of the problem of fossil fuels. They knew. And they did nothing about it at all. We know there's a very simple solution. Leave the fossil fuels in the ground, move to renewables, have a massive increase in energy efficiency. But that would mean challenging all those vested interests and ripping up the whole infrastructure of capitalism. And capitalism has got its great response because it creates these problems and then blames us. So I don't know if you know, but they're actually 50 biggest oil companies are actually planning at the moment to flood the markets with an extra, what, 7 million barrels of oil a day over the next decade. And at the heart of this is Shell, driving it forward, going to increase oil production by 35%. Except the chief executive of Shell recently told us, you need to eat seasonally and recycle more. Lambasted consumers eating strawberries in winter. How convenient. He can carry on pumping the oil. We're blamed for eating unseasonal uh, vegetable. And they do this on every issue, don't they? Capitalism creates war, creates climate change. When people try and flee it, it says, no, you can't come in. You're left to drown in the sea. If you experience racism and you're a Muslim, no, actually, it's your own fault. If you're a woman and you're attacked, you're blamed for maybe what you're wearing, not about a system that actually has sexism entrenched into it. And so... It is very clear what we're up against. The system, profit-driven, irrational, stopping at nothing to carry on making its profits. The question is, we know what we're against. What are we for? And I think for, for us in the SWP, when we talk about wanting system change, we're talking about socialism. Let's just be clear here. Socialism has nothing to do with what happened under Stalinist Russia or in Eastern Europe. 
They were brutal class societies, characterised by inequality, exploitation and repression. Nothing to do with socialism. And actually, socialism is not what's happening in countries like Cuba or Venezuela or China. They don't represent it. They are class societies too that haven't broken with capitalism. For me, as well as a revolutionary socialist, socialism is not limited to just what laws are passed in Parliament. You know, it would be brilliant if Corbyn's elected, and it would be brilliant if he renationalises the rail or the energy companies. But that doesn't make Britain a socialist country. Socialism is about the complete transformation of society, getting rid of capitalism completely, a vision of a world without war or poverty or racism or oppression. And crucially, it's about the so-called ordinary people, though we're not that ordinary, are we, but people like us running society directly. The people that do all the work, the majority of us on this planet, having an actual say in how society is organised, making decisions about what's made and produced. At the moment, these are made by a tiny minority of people who, by an accident of birth, are at the top of society, or because they use theft and plunder, war, colonialism and imperialism to seize hold of the wealth and so they can get to make the decisions. So when they get rid of class, when they get rid of that unelected, unaccountable minority that own all the land and raw materials and minerals and everything, we own it collectively and we the people who do all the work. So we'd have to get rid of the market economy, get rid of the profit motive. Under capitalism, things are only produced if they make a profit. Under socialism, we'd be making them because they're needed. It means running society in a completely different way. Instead of bosses telling us what to do, actually, we would run it. We could make better de uh, democratic decisions. I mean, who would be better to run it, the edu uh, education system, than teachers or lecturers or students themselves? Who better to run a health system than the doctors, the nurses, the carers? Who better to work any work, run any workplace than the workers? And I think you get a glimpse of that creative potential that we have when you see things like Extinction Rebellion. Listen to Victor, who was telling us about it in the other session. You know, all that creativity, taking over the streets, building a camp, having the art and the music, feeding and having food and everything. It shows what we can do. My God, what would it be like if we took over the whole of society <laughs> for more than two weeks? It would be amazing. We could really think about how you could build a sustainable society. And i tell you what, we must be able to run it better than people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and people like that. I mean, he, he thinks he's so clever. He thinks he's so clever, he wouldn't have died at Grenfell. I mean, how, what the contempt he has for working class people to save that common sense. Tell you what, though, we ran society, wouldn't we be putting combustible cladding all down house, you know, flats and houses? We wouldn't be doing that. And you think about all the other bosses that think they're running society. You might not have heard of him, Jim Ratcliffe. He's the owner of Ineos at Grangemouth, richest man in Scotland. You know, telling us to use less plastic. He's importing. He's importing natural gas to make more plastic. You know, these are the people running our society. We could do it better. Now, of course, I'm sure that there's a lot of us here who've probably thought about a vision of a different world. You know, often late at night, you had a few drinks or something, think about how the world could be different. And that's good. We have to have a different vision. But we have to think, how do we get it? That's the crucial question. And there's always been an argument, actually, within the socialist movement about whether you get socialism from above or from below. And what he's meant by that is, can socialism just come about from getting people elected into parliament, or does it involve much greater struggle? And the Labour Party project is essentially about socialism from above. It's the idea if we elect Corbyn, then they'll get change. Really, it's saying a small group of people will bring about change for us all. Problem is, even if there were 650 left-wing MPs in the House of Commons, the economy would still be in the hands of all the capitalists. And as we've seen, they're not going to be very happy about doing anything that will challenge their profits. They're not elected. They're not subject to any democratic control. And often that means that those governments just end up managing the existing system. We, in the Socialist Worker Party, in contrast, we're in the tradition of socialism from below, which is why we support Corbyn. It's why we're not in the Labour Party. Because if we're talking about the complete transformation of society, like what I was saying, and us all running it ourselves, it's going to take more than an election, it's going to take a revolution. And I want to be clear here, when we talk about revolution, we're not just talking about a little coup, us in this room, we'll go off and make it just us after this meeting. No, we're talking about a mass act involving millions of workers, students and people. And you see, often, we look at the other side, we talk about the power of the capitalist, the ruling class, and we have to be able to then match it with a counter-power. And that power is to be found outside Parliament. You see, it is true. They do control the media. They do control the financial institutions. They run the multinationals. They have lobbying power. But our side has millions of workers, the people that make the profits that capitalism relies on. 
and we have tremendous potential power. Now I say potential, because sometimes when you go to work, you don't always feel that powerful when your boss is telling you what to do. But actually, we're not just victims of capitalism. We have a potential power to take on the capitalists when we act collectively. And you know what? The ruling class know it. That's why they pass laws to try and stop strikes. Just think of the post-strike recently, well, the potential post-strike. You know, 97% of the workforce voted to take strike action on a 76% turnout. Even then, they wouldn't let them go on strike. They go to the High Court to stop the postal workers going on strike. And that is because they're scared that when people go on strike, it will hit their profits. Now, one of the most famous revolutionaries, you've probably heard of him, Karl Marx. Now, he identified this potential power and he was a big critic of capitalism. I mean, he was, just write, he was writing when it was just coming into being. But he was appalled about the inequality in society and the conditions that people had to live and work in, you know, whilst the rich lived in luxury. But he said capitalism produces its own grave diggers. That's what he called them, the people who could kill the system. The workers are the grave diggers, is what he said. And he predicted that capitalism would spread across the globe and would create even more workers, more grave diggers. And it's true. In 2013, the number of people in the global working class reached a majority of people, well, over one and a half billion people. And actually, it's been a massive rise of the working class in cities across the global south, India, Latin America, and other places. So we're the numerical majority. We're also precisely because we do all that work, we build the houses, we teach the kids, we grow the food, we transport everything, run the power plants. It means we've got that power to bring capitalism to a standstill and bring the system to a halt. When workers go on strike, occupy workplaces, go on the streets to protest, we start to hit back at those at the top of society. And we just heard from Mario how we've seen that in reality across the globe. 2019 has been this global year of revolt. It was a year yesterday since the start of the Yellow Vest revolt in France. We've seen Algeria, Sudan, Hong Kong, Chile, Ecuador, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran now. More countries than that. Uprisings going on. Different triggers in each one. Sometimes it might be the price of metro fares, or like the WhatsApp tax in Lebanon, or the price of oil going up in, in Iran. But they've generalised, but all that bitterness and anger that's often rumbling under the surface in society breaks out and generalises against those at the top. And they're young, because half of the population of the world is under 30. So the, global, the working class is global and it's young, just like the climate movements are as well. And it's the right way to organise. Because you know what? It's the only way we've ever won anything. The right to abortion, getting rid of segregation in the US, bringing down the apartheid in South Africa. All of it was fiercely resisted by those at the top. It was won by mass collective action, protests and strikes. But crucially, these global protests come at a time of growing polarisation. The far right has made gains. These show a different sort of resistance, don't they? That goes beyond elections that puts on the agenda actually revolution and opening for the left and potential to challenge those at the top. But finally, you see, capitalism isn't just going to go quietly. It's going to defend itself with ruthlessness and barbarity. We constantly see it. So we have to have a vision of a different world, but it's not enough just to dream about it. We are right, we can identify the power that can bring change, the working class. But that's not enough just to identify it. We have to be organised organised to fight for this change. I mean, Marx himself was always part of an organisation, trying to put his theory into practice. But it does mean organising differently. And that's what we try and do in the SWP. It's not just about elections. It's about supporting every struggle and linking them up, whether it's climate or pay or for the NHS or against racism or against transphobia. We link them up against the whole system, against capitalism, and put forward these socialist ideas and argue for revolution. OK, it's not just waiting for revolution. Everything we do now makes a difference. Protests brought about the moratorium on fracking. It's right that women have abortion rights. Actually, if McDonald's workers win £15 an hour, that will be a gain for everybody. But we have to take on that whole system, and it's very urgent. We talk about the polarisation going to the right as well. We have to fight for this. And I don't know if people heard Wayman Bennett speaking yesterday. He said we have to be organised because the opportunities will present themselves. But the opportunities alone, are we going to be organised enough to take advantage of them? Struggle will break out, but what is the outcome of the struggle? In that struggle, are we going to be organised as revolutionaries when the pressure comes on to stop protesting on the streets? The pressure is on to go back to work. The pressure is on to go back to the business as usual of the barbarity of capitalism. 
when that pressure is on, are we organised enough to say, no, we're going forward, we want to challenge the whole system and smash capitalism completely? And that's what we're saying to you today. If you agree with that we need to go forward and do that, then join us in the fight. The stakes are very high. The urgency of the situation could not be more when we're talking about saving the planet and stopping the far right and the fascists. So join us in the SWP in that fight to get rid of capitalism and fight for a completely different world which we run ourselves free of exploitation and oppression.